Okay, great. Let's just start, I think, and people can join. We'll be recording this anyway, so just yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, welcome everyone to our webinar on citizen assemblies at a local scale. Some of you may recognize me from our previous webinar on online deliberation. Um, but if you are new to us, I am the um, business development manager for the UK at Citizen Lab. And Citizen Lab's mission is to provide local councils with an e-democracy platform to facilitate the engagement of residents in the policy making process. Um, I have the pleasure of having with me today Graham Smith, Professor of Politics and Director of the um, Centre for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster, and Sarah Allen, um, Head of Engagement at Involve UK. Just before we introduce the panelists, um, a few very quick housekeeping rules. Um, you should all be muted. If that is not the case, please do make sure you keep your microphone off. If you have any questions, feel free to add them to the chat at any time, and we will cover them at the end of the webinar, at the end of the session. Um, and then, of course, this webinar will be recorded. We will share the recording early next week with all of those who registered, along with some information about our next webinar um, in November. So with no further ado, let's turn to the speakers. Sarah Graham, lovely to have you here today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And um, it would be great to start with this session with a little um, round of introductions. Maybe Sarah, if we can start with you, I'm sure that some of our listeners have um, come across your name over the last few weeks and months in relation to the results of the um, UK Climate um, Citizens Assembly. But it would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about how you got to where you are today and what encouraged you to dedicate um, your career or at least a part of it to public engagement and democracy that would be really interesting to hear about. Okay then so I guess the interest for me then started really early on um, in sixth form I think when um, people were discussing as a general election most of most of my peers were voting it and I realized that you know, concepts, for example, about left and right wing was something that I knew about because my family talked about it at home, but was something that was completely foreign to the other people kind of in, in my year group. They, they didn't know that. And they were finding it quite hard to engage with the election because of that and to kind of distinguish between different things that politicians were, were saying and promising. And I guess that started then with me feeling that, you know, an interest in political education um, and kind of how to make it a more level platform for people and gradually over the years that's expanded into looking at other ways in which it's hard for people to participate and in ways in which participation could be more meaningful and more equal for people and I guess through that long process I've come to looking at things like citizens assemblies and different deliberative and participative to participative forms of getting involved is something that can really provide people with a really meaningful say in the decisions that affect their lives. Sounds great. Thank you so much for that. And maybe Graham, over to you now. I'm wondering if you could do the same. Just tell us a little bit about your background and why you've decided to dedicate your academic career to the study of democracy. Um, yeah, I guess I guess for me, it goes back to um, being an activist uh, when I was younger and, and just looking at how how so, so many um, decisions were so were poor, were poorly made, and particularly didn't take into account the perspectives and voices of most marginalised within within um, communities. And just becoming more more committed to ideas of political equality um, and uh, the idea that uh, you know you are, we aren't going to see sound collective judgments unless we bring in the voices and the empower those who are not being heard in the political process and particularly living in the UK where we've got such centralized government that becomes even more apparent. Mm. Yeah sounds great great thank you so much and um, I hope our listeners now understand why we've invited both of you which is such interesting backgrounds to talk about citizens assemblies and their impact for, um, for leaders at a local scale. I've prepared a few questions um, which I hope will take us through the next sort of 30 minutes and from there we can take some questions from the um, from the audience as well. Um, maybe just to um, to kind of pick off the conversation why don't we just start thinking about um, an overview of the citizens assemblies in the UK and maybe Graham you could take us back to the early stages of those assemblies when did we really start thinking about them again because obviously they go back to the origins of democracy but more recently where did that thinking start and what were some of the early experiences with um, citizens assemblies in the UK? Okay so just just to be sure and I'm sure most people do on this call um, know I don't want to 
<clears throat> make people suck eggs or whatever the phrase is. But you know, it's just to be clear, a citizens assembly brings together a randomly selected group of um, participants who then are facilitated through a process of, deliber of learning, deliberation, and coming to collective recommendations about about how how to respond to the task that they've been they've been set. So um, that particular model has actually been around for about. 50 years from citizens juries in the states and planning cells in Germany um, and actually there was a sort of interest in the 90s in the UK around the new Labour government in citizens juries but the, the, this wave of citizens assemblies which are larger bodies typically somewhere between 50 and 100 people spending usually an, uh, spending a number of weekends on a particular topic really came to this country in the in um, 2015 2017 when there are a couple of pilot projects that I was involved in that tried to show the, the, the potential of these. And we were really building on what happened in Ireland around the kind of uh, assemblies that had led to changes in same-sex marriage and, and abortion and showing actually that this could happen in the UK. Not surprisingly, our politicians have been saying, oh, it can happen in Canada, it can happen in Ireland, it can happen in Australia, but it couldn't possibly happen here. So we wanted to run a couple of pilots. And one of those we was when we first started working where, where I first started working with Sarah was on the citizens assembly on Brexit and actually interestingly it was a national level assembly which was the next assembly which was the which was the one run by Sarah on the social care for two select committees and it was only in the sort of 29 around sort of 2019 that, that local authorities started to use this model um, mostly because of promotion by DCMS the the Department of Government around their innovations in democracy program. So there were three run there, Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership on transport issues and Dudley and Tess Valley Borough Council, both working on town centres. And roughly at the same time, Kingston were running one on air pollution. Waltham Forest ran a really interesting process on, on hate crime and hate incidents. And then suddenly we saw this kind of um, just explosion, not explosion, a, a, a significant number of local authorities starting to use them for climate change. And that's been the main focus. And we saw about five or six before COVID and a couple of, and a, and a citizen's jury alongside that in Leeds. And now we're seeing a whole series of them being done online. So mm. it's really only, this, this practice has only been around really at local government level for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so, and we're seeing kind of, a significant expansion of that practice over that time. Mm, that makes sense. I was wondering if from those examples you would be able to identify one which has been particularly successful. Could you, you know, talk about one where some of those um, recommendations have actually fed yeah. into the policy making process, whether it's at a local level or, in, or at a national level at this stage? The, yeah, the, the one I would choose just because it's unusual is actually the Wolf and Forest one, which was on, which was on hate, hate incidents and hate crime. And the reason, mm -hmm. I, the reason I say that is because I think they did, they, they did a really solid piece of work where they engaged with different um, community organisations um, beforehand about the idea of a citizens assembly and how it might work and whether they were supportive of the idea. And they've really thought about it as a local authority about if we set this up, how are we going to respond to it? And how can we bring the different partners in the community, the police, other agencies along for the ride? And they really had that all in place before they even thought about doing the citizens assembly. So I was really yeah. impressed by that. And now they've committed to fulfill mm -hmm. all the recommendations from the citizens assembly. Who were obviously COVID's hit mm -hmm. and, um, and that's put some of it back, but they have really taken the process seriously. And so for me, and it's something we might come back to in a minute, is they've embedded it in a broader engagement with community organizations and with engagement with other actors and with themselves about what are we going to do when the Citizens Assembly delivers its recommendations? And I think for me, that was a really interesting one. And also because of the issue, because mostly people think about these things in more in relation to planning issues and, and those sorts of issues. It's really interesting to see it being done on, on a social policy issue like hate. Mm -hmm. No, that sounds really interesting. And maybe the next thing I would like to do, maybe with you, Sarah, I would really like to unwrap a little bit that whole process of organizing a citizens assembly. And maybe we can talk about that climate assembly, which has drawn so much attention over the last few months. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about, you know, starting from the setup, how would you set a citizens assembly up? How did you do it with this one? Um, maybe talk us through what worked well, what didn't work so well. It would be really interesting to get some insight into the practical side of things of running a citizens assembly. I mean, that's a, a how long people bring kind of kind of question. And I, I think it's also worth saying that 
different citizens assemblies that run in different ways and have different structures kind of around their, how they engage with kind of expert uh, subject area expertise and advisory panels and so on but but to say a little bit about um the climate assembly that's just been run by six select committees or commissioned by six select committees in parliament climate assembly uk that we've run so just to start off for people who are, who are less aware of it so it was the first uk-wide citizens assembly on climate change as i said it was commissioned by six select committees as the house of commons um, and they gave it a really clear remit which is i think one thing that's that's really important with citizens assembly so they wanted to know specifically how the youth public's view on how the UK should get to net zero by 2050. So a really specific question. Uh, and they were also very clear that they wanted the assembly to take a thematic approach. Um, so something that was kind of easily translatable back into the different committee's remits. And they wanted us to get to the level of policy detail. So they wanted to get this right down into some of the nitty gritty. And that's because the committees were, were pretty clear about how they wanted to use the outcomes of the assembly. So they want to use it in their work to help scrutinize the government's progress and getting to net zero. And it's just those sorts of policy questions, as well as questions about overall direction and process that they're going to have to engage with. And I think that just to echo Graham's point, that's something else that's very important when setting up an assembly. So a clear remit, but also understanding how it's going to feed back into decision making. And I think with the committees wanting to take it on and kind of look at kind of what future inquiries they should they should hold and also choose it to inform inquiries that they have planned. You know, perhaps that isn't as clear as some other as some other examples from the Citizens Assembly on Social Care run by two committees, it was to form a specific inquiry, but it was clear enough and we've seen the committees pick that up and really work with it since. So I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, then kind of what do you do when you get you get a brief like that. So I think the next thing you do is you look at the budget that you've got uh, really um, and look at what it can do in terms of numbers of participants and numbers of weekends. So Parliament was very clear that it wanted a Citizens Assembly. Um, it was also clear that it wanted a significant number of participants. So looking at kind of 100 plus participants, but that's something that we discussed with them. So obviously the more participants you have, the fewer weekends your budget is going to cover. And that's something that's really important to consider when you're thinking about your citizens assembly, what your trade-offs are there. And then the next thing to, to look at is what does that mean you can cover? So it's very important that you are matching the kind of scope of what you're hoping to cover to the amount of time that you have available to you. It's much better to do fewer things better mm -hmm. or in less detail than to try and do far too much. And then it's a bad experience for participants. You don't, you don't get Kind of kind of the meaningful things you should have out of it so for the climate assembly um we experimented with splitting and it's been done you know the, the french assembly uh, convention on the climate did, did a similar not exactly the same but a similar thing in that not all assembly members did the same thing at the same time so we started off with them working all together to look at kind of the principles that should underpin the path to net zero the kind of overarching framework but then when we looked at questions got on some of the more specific questions for some of those that time the assembly split into three groups so that they were able to look at three and each group looked at two-ish topics so that were able to cover five topics it was in total um in the time available when actually if they'd all done the same thing we'd have only been able to cover two but but all the same there had to be some clear decisions about what we weren't covering too so we didn't get to things like pensions and divestment for example uh, which you could you might hope to, to to cover if you were looking at every part of the path to net zero but it was very important for us again working with the subject area specialists to, to look at what you know to make it manageable to do in the time I think I've, I've talked for a while so maybe I'll stop and you can say where you'd like me to go from there but certainly a clear remit looking at your number of people your amount of time and fitting what you're hoping to cover into that time whether that's about splitting people up whether it's about everybody doing you know we had 100 plus people so even when you split people up you were talking at kind of 35 36 people looking at each topic and we also made sure I think it's important to say that all the 100 uh, and eight people taking part could feed into every topic as well so that was also an important part of the design and it was just a smaller group that looked at it and kind of like really delved into the depths of it but those are the really important to bear in mind 
I, I have a quick question about um, the profile of the participants, because obviously I imagine they are selected um, quite randomly. Um, how I imagine everyone starts with a different um, kind of um, base in terms of understanding the topic that they're discussing. How do you go about that? And how do you uh, manage to educate and inform the people who are going to give those recommendations? Because I imagine that some of them start with very little knowledge of what actually climate change policies entail. Yeah, I mean, I think the level of detail that a citizen's assembly goes into goes, for most people, goes beyond what, you know, what they thought about. It's not true for everybody, but how many people kind of have a detailed sense about which greenhouse gas removal technologies they want to be used or a detailed plan um, for, for um, how kind of how we travel on the land should work, for example. Um, but I think the important thing is then to start assuming no prior knowledge um, mm -hmm. and to start with the background. So, and... So we started the climate assembly, although it wasn't looking, it was looking at how to get to net zero. We started with some backgrounds about what climate change is, how certain, what you know, what its impacts might be, how certain or not as well. We are about that, perhaps why it's been difficult to make progress on some of those issues to date, why it's a difficult subject to look at. And also what net zero means. I mean, we spent quite a bit of time on that. What, what is net zero? And then starting to unpack on the first weekend, some of them, the broader issues for people. So some of these kind of overarching ethical, strategic, practical questions about how we might net to get to net zero and kind of how, you know, in a kind of overarching sense, but then also kind of in a practical sense, kind of if you do a bit more here, you don't have to do so much there and giving people kind of a real sense of how the whole jigsaw fits together. Mm -hmm. I think you start with the background um, and I think also quite useful to then get to start to, the first decision we had was to get people to look at the kind of principles they thought should underpin it so to help people kind of get that sense about what's important to them as they then go on and hear more detailed evidence so it's mm. about where you start um, but it's also important to really break the evidence down so we never had people where well, we asked people to only speak for 10 minutes each um, we stopped after each one or two speakers to give people like a real chance to think about what questions they wanted to ask the speakers and to write those down. We never had a panel with more than six people on it in total. We put in breaks where necessary. So really thinking about how you then kind of structure and chunk up the evidence so that it's not too much for people in any one go. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is important that as well as giving people that initial thing, when we hear the presentations, we're asking people to kind of signpost the key points that they want to make. But the question and answer sessions that happen with people giving evidence afterwards are so important. So that's why you know, ideally you have speakers coming round to each table and people are really able to kind of ask them the follow-up questions they want, you know, challenge them on different points and really get into the subject matter in an awful lot more depth and providing that sort of more informal opportunity so it's not just presentations is a really important part of the learning process as are then the people's conversations with each other so it's people don't just learn from the speakers they learn from each other's life experiences each other's preferences each other's values and that happens in a formal way around the table and then if you're meeting face to face um also happens i think over lunch and over coffee breaks where people kind of continue talking and some of yeah. some and I guess it's one of the really beautiful takeaways, at least for me, is that you see, you really do see that anyone can um, influence the policymaking process, anyone can take part in a democratic process, it doesn't really matter where you start from or what your background is, it's about that willingness to learn something and listen to each other, right? Speakers are always, so yeah, I mean, absolutely, and speakers are always, I think, consistently surprised about the quality of the questions that they get. And how well people have got their head around the subject matter and we've got that time and time again at the climate assembly people kind of a bit <laughs> kind of in awe after kind of an hour of questions that they had from the assembly members that are just exactly what they've been asked and how well people have grasped it mm. and then also in terms of how um your participants would see that opportunity maybe for our local leaders to understand if there was appetite from people to actually take part in that i was wondering did they feel kind of honored to do that was it more like kind of did they feel like a duty towards the country what was their motivation to do it it's really interesting and i think actually a piece of work looking at the, the motivation for people when they get a letter inviting them to take part why they decide to would be really interesting um i know our independent evaluators who are reporting early next year i think that that's one of the things they're looking at and I'm, I'm very keen to see it i think anecdotally you get a real mix of reasons so you, you get people who i think quite a few people talked about it being their sense of civic duty like they got a letter from parliament in this case and they, it felt like a bit be, like being asked to do jury service and they wanted to take part 
other people talked about the fact well it was about climate change and they maybe didn't know that much about it but they had children and grandchildren and they felt it was something they should know more about mm -hmm. and wanted that kind of learning opportunity some people had strong views either way on the issues I mean you just get this whole some people just think a citizen assembly sounds interesting they're kind of curious you know mm. or like a weekend away yeah you know like you, you get this whole whole range range of things and that and that's it, that's good because it, it means that you're getting a representative sample of the population and i imagine in COVID times that was even more the case because it would be an opportunity to actually discuss something with other people outside of your household and actually talk about something meaningful because it felt for such a long time like we were kind of stuck there was nothing we could actually do whereas this was an opportunity to keep contributing to something meaningful while being at home and talking to new people so i guess that, that brought a new dimension to it doing it in COVID times I mean, I guess, I mean, certainly people were very keen to keep the assembly going, that we'd yeah. got such a long way through. We only had one weekend left when we couldn't meet face to face anymore and people wanted to keep it going. And people were certainly very happy to see each other. I, I mean, I'd be interested to know whether it's something that, that helped people um, when they were looking at in other ways or not. On, on that, um, I was just involved in a practitioner workshop with people who are running online assemblies because they've taken this on. Um, yeah. They're running from, you know, big combined authorities like north of Tyne right the way down to a small citizens jury being run in Kendall by the town council and that's mm -hmm. a you know there's a scale thing there which we might talk about but they were saying the people who are organizing them were saying actually they they seem to that digital is actually bringing diff, not different people but but some people are really who who might be who might not have participated in a face to face for various reasons are willing to do it digitally and and vice versa and actually they're finding the, the inclusions and exclusions are slightly different. It's really interesting about who's who's willing to put themselves forward to work with digital. But that they are a lot of work into making sure the whole issues around digital access. So they're trying to make sure you know they 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 are lending machines. They are making sure that people have you know are, are can can connect to the internet because in order to make this as an accessible process as possible. Mm. There's that and also the fact that um, it's a completely different thing to be behind a screen because you're going to have a few people who are going to be very vocal and then others maybe not being so vocal. We at Citizen Lab have actually developed a workshop feature and what we try to do without keeping in mind that we want this tool to enable residents to influence the policy making process is that we have a huge component, component of written input being kind of complementing yeah. the complementing the whole kind of speaking process no, I, because those who don't feel that comfortable maybe talking are going to write it instead i agree on that but the thing you've got to remember about a citizens assembly which i think is different from a lot of participatory processes is it is a highly facilitated process so mm -hmm. um you know that's where people like sarah are so skilled in terms of making bringing people in so i think a lot of um online stuff that i've seen isn't very well facilitated hence yeah. you get that distinct differentiation but, that, but a lot of work is done by uh, table facilitators or people working in small in small online rooms to ensure that to inclusiveness. Excellent. And we've and we got lots of data to show that, that that really work can work. Mm -hmm. and, and just so you, you can replicate that online. So yeah. you know, if you're using Zoom, for example, you go into your breakout rooms, we put a facilitator in every breakout room and we use actually in some ways it's reasonably similar how you think about making sure um, that everybody feels comfortable participating and how you encourage that online as well as offline. Great, and maybe just to kind of move to the next question as we, uh, as we are progressing through time here um, and take it back to the local kind of scale. Uh, quickly, maybe from Sarah, if local leaders read your report on the Climate Assembly, what do you hope would be the one or two main takeaways for them at a local level? And then maybe, Graham, you can add a little bit more on that, on what you think, um, how, how local leaders can take this further. Okay, so I'm going to flip that question slightly because we have run quite a few uh, local citizen assemblies as well, including including uh, with the Democratic Society, the one in Walton Forest that Graham was mentioning on hate crime. So I think looking across that work and talking to my colleagues who've worked on the local assemblies, I think we've got six main takeaways uh, for local leaders. And I promise I'll, I'll, I'll run through them pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so first of all, uh, I think a key thing is to be actually committed to using the results of the assembly, not just wanting to be seen to run one. You know, you take, mm -hmm. If you're going to do it, take it seriously. There's nothing worse uh, than engagement that, that's kind of a tick box exercise. People see right through it and you can do yourself a lot more damage than, than not running engagement at all. Um, secondly, don't jump on the idea of a process. Think about what the purpose of your engagement is first. You know, Citizens Assembly might not be the right thing for you for what you want to do for the budget you have 
and so on. And actually, do you need to specify the process itself in the tender or just your brief for what you want to achieve if you are going to tender for someone to run something for you? Mm -hmm. And when I say like think about your purpose first, get really clear on your purpose. So we see a lot of proposals coming through involved that are, uh, you know, they want to have this process that achieves like 15 different, quite different things or four or even you know, just four, but very different objectives. So you might be wanting to do one more, more than one bit of engagement in the end, but what do you want out of this process specifically? Mm -hmm. um, next, who is going to take the recommendations forward? So I guess that links to my first point. Um, a bit do you know how it's feeding into your own decision making processes you, you you really need to but also do you need other stakeholders involved so I touched on a little bit about kind of advisory boards and thinking about that kind of wider kind of stakeholder engagement but for example you know if you're running something on transport you need you might have a local transport provider or you're running something on, on climate change more generally there might be a local transport provider you might not be able to as a local authority actually implement the recommendations so who else might you need to have buy-in from um fifthly um something that we didn't do um, as as the uh climate assembly run by parliament but i really would do um if I, if I was a local area, is to think about crowdsourcing before going into uh, the assembly. I mean, there's lots of different ways that can work, but I would definitely think about wider engagement before going into the citizens' assembly process. Um, and then lastly, um, also the citizens' assembly process, it's not the end or it's not the solution in itself. You know, it's the start of an engagement process, particularly if you're looking at something like climate change, which is going to be such a feature for the next, you know, if we're talking about 2050, that's already 30 years and it's going to go beyond that. So be thinking about think about it as part of a process and maybe you're reaching out more widely beforehand. You've got your citizens assembly if that's the right method for you, but then be aware that you're going to need to take some decisions about how engagement works going forward. Mm -hmm. as well. So there you go. That's my top six. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Graham, anything to add to that? Anything you think local leaders can do to take this forward? No, so I, I think kind of following with what Sarah said is I think you need to they need to look into their soul and think am I, am I why am I doing this am I doing it for the right reasons I think lots of people are reaching for citizens assemblies because they've seen other places do citizens assemblies whereas mm -hmm. actually I think both Sarah and I would actually rather people say what's the problem I'm facing what's the what's the best way of doing engagement around that and it may well be that citizens assembly is the answer to that question but it isn't always mm. so and I think there is this danger and we saw it I, I'm old enough to remember this we saw it around citizens juries with new labor everybody wanted to run a citizens jury they didn't know why they wanted to run one but they all wanted to be seen to be running one mm -hmm. so i think that's my biggest issue is is making sure that the, the 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 reason that a citizens assembly is being run is the right one and that actually everything around the citizens assembly that needs to be in place for it to be effective has been committed to i know a couple mm -hmm. of authorities where you know, a, a leader or a, you know, a particular councillor has taken this on as their pet project. And it's been a really interesting project, but then the council hasn't been willing to accept the findings because mm -hmm. it was never, there was never buy-in. So what mm -hmm. was it, you know, it was a big waste of money and a big waste of time really. So I think that for me, yeah, it sounds deep, look into your soul and make sure this is the right thing. <laughs> and, and speaking of purpose, um, we talk about Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, you know, assistance assembly is, is an that's engagement good. that you do is a fair amount of work and for assistance assembly, a, a fair amount of budget. And if you're going to do it, commit to doing it properly. Mm. Absolutely. And um, just because we're speaking of purpose, um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, citizens assemblies in the longer term and taking it from here, because we've been talking so much about climate change in the last few months. But what are some of the other areas where local leaders can find purpose? Where do you think, you know, um, residents would be able to contribute uh, with an assembly? Which policy topics would be most um, most kind of relevant, in your opinion, from your experience? I mean, lo lots of topics are really are, are very relevant. I mean, the classic thing to say nationally is is that um, you know you look at the topics that are particularly controversial, complex, moral, or, or constitutional as kind of key things for citizens' assembly. But I think more specifically than that, for for a local level, so the key thing to remember if you are thinking citizens' assembly as opposed to other methods, which you may not be, um, then citizens' assemblies are about. A representative sample of the population so you're looking for a topic where you want to hear from a representative sample so not something where it's very important to hear about a specific group's lived experience 
um, for example, where you want to engage with a specific set of people rather than your population yeah. as a whole. And if you're thinking citizens assembly, then you're looking for something where you, it's not just about asking people about the experience they already have, so their experience using a service, because citizens assembly, you've got that element of giving people information um, mm -hmm. and then using that too. So if you're looking for something where the, the appropriate, where it needs that whole kind of learn, discuss, yeah. each recommendations thing that a citizens assembly does. Um, but beyond that, I think things that citizens assembly is good at, for example, if you've got an issue that, that's really locally deadlocked, mm -hmm. um, a citizens assembly can help kind of un unblock some of that by showing what a representative sample of the local population think should happen. Mm -hmm. um, a particularly complex issue, like how the area should respond to climate change, for example, is it makes makes a lot of sense. Um, an area where I think um, you want to be clear that, that what you're doing, you're going to do the thing that's supported locally would be the other, other thing. So for example, there's been citizens assemblies on, on how local high streets should be regenerated or what should happen for them, for example, um, mm -hmm. where people really wanted to know that they were doing what the community wanted them to do. Um, mm -hmm. That makes sense as well. So those sorts of, those sorts of things. Mm. Anything you'd add to that, Graham? No, I think I think there's a there's a friend, a colleague of ours who who, who promotes um, citizens assemblies and similar models in in um, Australia, and he always starts his conversation with leaders saying, "So, what is the hardest decision you're facing?" Yeah. You know, and and his point is, it's not always the same wherever you are. You know, yeah. and and his he doesn't always say a citizens assembly is the right is the right way to to, to respond to that hardest decision, but his opening gambit is. What are the really tough things that you've not been able to deal with, and and that and citizens assembly may be the right answer to, to yeah. to be to be to dealing with that. And I think you know anything from those kind of social issues that we're talking about with with Waltham Forest, of to to do with um, with climate change. I'd like to see things being more specific on specific policy areas around climate change, so to to really get get that bite, and mm -hmm. around planning issues as well. And and um, mm -hmm. there's been some really good stuff being done in Canada where. Um, where uh, assemblies run alongside over a period of time alongside the planning process and that planners can come to the um, assembly with particular questions that emerge at that you know they, they realize it's not a one-off it's something that they need yeah. to they need to be is an iterative process so we, we haven't been creative enough with these bodies yet yeah. but I think there's lots of different ways and maybe so what really resonated with me is the fact that you said that, um, you know, some local councils feel like they have to do the citizens assembly because everyone is doing them. Um, and I can completely relate to that because working in the field, but around a different thing, which is an online engagement platform, we get the same kind of issue, you know, sometimes local councils tend to think that you will adopt a tool and that will solve all of your issues. But actually the most important thing is the thinking before that. I was wondering if you could maybe, if we could talk a little bit about the limitations of citizens assembly least what do they not cover when are they not really helpful and what are some of the alternatives in those cases yeah so it's okay it's so sort of issue specific if you see what i mean in the sense of um i mean we've both sarah and i've been very clear about about the the broader commitment needed to make these things work and and so that's one th point where they really aren't the right thing to do when you're not committed to to following mm -hmm. through with this kind of work um, and Sarah also mentioned there are certain types of issues where, where actually what you want to be doing is engaging with particular service users and, and engaging with a broader population makes no, makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, these do you things... See, do you Sorry, see any on. limitation, uh, apologies for interrupting, but do you see any limitations in the fact that they are so selective in the sense that you just have a small number of people? Do you think you may be missing out? on certain um, contributions because um, it stays quite a quite a selective process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is always a tension within within participatory and deliberative processes. And I noticed someone Paul's already said something in the chat about this is, you know, that tension between um, what you might call, uh, you know, um, small, you know, select and deep and then kind of, you know, spread, but but sort of thin. And I think you're, there's always that real tension. And I think on certain issues, you you not you it isn't enough to get the top of the head um top of the head responses because our top of the head responses are based on us not having thought about the issue in in much depth so i think those more complex issues those more 
challenging long-term issues, um, you know, those, those more conflictual issues are ones where we really need time and, and actually doing a, do it, you know, so, so I think that's where citizens' assemblies have an advantage. I think you're right in the sense that there, there can be a danger that these things can be seen as, oh, this was just a small group of, of people who did this. And, and th a lot of that problem is actually about transparency. And we haven't talked about that. And one of the really great things about Sarah's work with the Climate Assembly was that everything was made transparent. What was said to the, you know, that, that what was being done every day, you can go and actually watch all of the presentations. What you can't see is the citizens deliberating with each other because that can't be made public because you know mm -hmm. that, that there would be that pressure from outside yeah. but actually with local councils they don't, don't often have the money to actually make things transparent in the same way and, and actually, actually I think that's really critical and for me for me I think that we've already said I don't I don't always think it's like citizens assembly against another model I think it's about how we combine these models together yeah. to be honest yeah so I've I think gone that... on a bit there so sorry no, 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 absolutely. That's really interesting. And it's my feeling as well that there is no one single solution. It's really about combining all of the different tools that we have and trying to reach out to as many people as possible in different ways, really. Um, Sarah, I'm just wondering if you have something to, to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, earlier, I, I would go with Graham about, you know, the strengths of the Citizens Assembly in terms of depth and on being a contentious issue. But I mean, I did say earlier that I thought if I was doing it locally, I would want to do quite a lot of outreach. You know, it could be crowdsourcing ideas or something else beforehand in a local context. And I think Graham and I uh, were talking uh, yesterday, I think, actually, about what they were doing in Devon and how they kind of in that outreach that happened beforehand, it become very clear what those contentious and controversial issues were and that they then want to focus the assembly on those issues that are particularly controversial. And I think that that's something else. Um, that, that can show you what the best use is. But I, I really don't think citizens' assemblies are the right, I mean, I spend some of my time talking people down from running citizens' assemblies where I don't think it's the right thing for them. And I think, we, Graham, we've already talked a bit about, you know, it might not be the right thing because you might be needing to talk to people with a specific lived um, experience. You might not need to do the whole informing process because it might just be about asking about their aspirations for the area, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Or something else um, an issue might not also might not be suitable because for example it might be a traumatic issue um mm -hmm. and it might be much more suitable to do individual interviews with somebody for example um and um i think as well i think it, you know citizens assemblies you know they're big and they're, they're quite expensive do you need that would a citizens jury something so even if you are looking for a representative sample of people do you need to do something as big as a citizens assembly could you do something sort of smaller and then use some of your budget for kind of some of that wraparound activity that Graham and I are talking about. So mm -hmm. I, I just to re-emphasize what I said before that, that I think, you know, what you need to think about when, you, when you're thinking about engagement is, you know, your purpose. What can the public tell you that nobody mm -hmm. else can tell you? Like, like mm -hmm. essentially that's the question, isn't it? What are you trying to get out of it? What's the scope of it? You know, what's included in what you're wanting them to look at, what's not included, you know, what outcomes you're looking for and um, but also like your budget and your time scale you know you, you, your citizens assembly might be great but you don't have the money you don't have the money to to, to do it so you know there will be other ways of, of getting at what you want to get at. so yeah I'd, as i said i'm not entirely sure that people putting um specifying what process they want to run in tenders if, if it councils are tendering is necessarily the right thing and actually what would be really helpful in tenders is a really clear design brief you know this is the question we're trying to address these are the people who it's important for us to engage or important factors yeah. about who want to engage. this is the time scale this is the decision making process it's going to fit into and then people can come back to you with different ideas about how you could how you could do it drawing on kind of like lots of different methods from crowdsourcing world cafe installations participatory budgeting you know interview techniques surveys citizens assemblies citizens juries appreciative inquiry i mean there are so many methods mm. and just a quick question to just finish all of that and maybe one final question before we move to the q a would you recommend any sort of um platform where councils can learn from each other in terms of citizen assemblies is there anything like that set up or any other kind of resources obviously i'm sure the involved blog i mean it is a great resource so i'm sure you're going to recommend that but is there anything else in terms of uh, best practices sharing best practices between councils that is set up and that councils could go to um for um advice and ideas so it involves uh, running a network for at the moment for local councils um, who want to share advice and, and swap ideas and ask each other questions. So I think if, if you'd like to join that, it's free to join. Um, do, do let me know. Uh, do let someone involved 
know uh, my email is sarah involved at org.uk and i can forward you on to the right person uh, i'll share that with the um with the uh, participants anyway so um so they'll have all of your details if they want to reach out and, and ask any questions can i just say um, actually that's a really great result because they they, they organize reg or they have organized regular meetings like this well, well no, not like this more 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 um with it but, but going through particular problems that uh, local authorities have got and and show, showcasing particular local authorities that are doing interesting work. So mm -hmm. I recommend Sorry. it highly. Perfect. I think so we're just moving that also into a kind of a space which allows people to be able to ask each other questions be between the more formal setups as well. Um, so that can be like a real peer support, peer networking element to that as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to wrap this conversation up, I just wanted to take it to a kind of a higher level um, question about um, um, uh, reform at the local government level. We've been hearing quite a bit about potential reforms, about uh, bringing councils together. I was just wondering what your thoughts are, are on how that could affect local democracy, how those potential reforms which haven't happened yet, but we think might happen um, at some point in the near future. Um, what are your thoughts on how that could impact local democracy? Um, you want to start I, I, now? <laughs> but it, yes. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking here about sort of creating the, you know, the one of the arguments about creating larger unitary authorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is personally very uh, significant to me because I live in Wiltshire and I live in Salisbury and Salisbury used to have its own council now has the equivalent of a parish council. Um, so, uh, you know, don't get me started on that. But the, uh, the I think there is an issue here about size and local democracy. And I think Sarah, will, and I'm sure Sarah will say something around about, about, more about this, but you know, obviously any authority at any size can do public engagement well. The one thing we know from across Europe is the smaller the size of a local authority, the more capacity they have to do the kind of ongoing community engagement in their work. The larger that authority is, the more challenging that is. Yeah. So I think for local democracy, this kind of like, creation of larger and larger blocks is not great. It mm. does mean though, on the counter, countering that is there's more potential for really significant engagement on strategic issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there is a, there's a, but on, on day to day community based democracy and participatory democracy, the, 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 the fact that we're going to larger units is problematic. It may be good reasons for doing it for other reasons, but for democracy, I think there are challenges. Mm. Interesting, thank you. So, I mean, this isn't uh, my specialist area at all, so I have to have a big disclaimer about this. <laughs> government structures. It's not something that, that I, have, I have a specific view on. So to make a more general point, um, I think I'd talk about kind of the limits of structure. Um, uh, so, you know, it's perfectly possible to have, um, you know, something sort of more remote from people that engages really well and something that's nearer to people that engages really, really poorly. And so it, it's not just about where you're situated in relationship relation to people, it's how you view your role as a council, how you view your relationships uh, with your local citizens and, and, and people and residents um, and how you engage with them. So I think, like Graham said, there are some benefits, probably that, that sounds logical to me, that there are some different benefits. And I certainly think you know, being closer gives you some opportunities. But if you just replicate locally something that people were finding unengaging and undemocratic, slightly further away from them, you, you don't gain anything. Mm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I could keep listening for hours, but unfortunately we are reaching the end of this webinar. So I do want to leave just a couple of minutes for questions. And I can see that Graham, you've been particularly active on responding to certain things there. I haven't even had the, the, the chance to read them, but I do think that one came up around budget. So um, a few participants were wondering um, what the budget for the Climate Assembly was. I don't know if you can share that with us. And um, if you have any idea about how, you know, what the budget would be for a local um, sort of assembly um, that would be interesting as well um, I appreciate it it's a bit of a, of a broad question but anything you could share on that I will say the budget for so the climate assembly UK the budget is transparent so the budget was 520,000 pounds but you have to remember that that is people coming it's 108 people coming from across the UK having to have all their travel or their accommodation for, for most of the weekends um, over, over a large number of weekends as well so you wouldn't you know, that's that's a UK wide process. You wouldn't be expecting a budget anything like that for a local process. Um, I think that's really important to state. Um, because I haven't run our local work, I don't have like a pluck a figure out the air. 
figure for a local process. But if you are thinking um, about budgeting a local process, I mean, certainly that's something you get out of our local council network. Um, but um, key things to think about are, um, so have you got a venue, you know, are you gonna need to pay venue costs or do you have a suitable venue? Um, what scope is your local area? Are people gonna be able to go home in the evening or are you looking at paying accommodation? Kind of what refreshment costs um, are you gonna have? And then importantly, I think your honorarium. So we would always uh, say you need to recompense and provide a financial gift for people to compensate them uh, for, their, for their time. So mm -hmm. those things together, so for the climate assembly, it was a hundred, um, well, people were staying overnight, right? From Friday evening to Sunday lunchtime, traveling big distances. So it was 150, um, pounds per person per weekend now you don't necessarily need to offer so much at a local level and again that's something that the network would be mm -hmm. able to tell you about but those things that participant part of the process um, are your major are probably your major costs so if you can think about that um, and then maybe it's the cost for facilitators to facilitate whoever you want to design but the, the, the big variable is that about how many people over how many weekends do you need accommodation um, and that kind of that kind of consideration? And if you are doing it online um, as well, so I think as Graham as Graham was saying, you know, processes that involve is starting online. I think others are starting online as well. We are looking to provide internet and hardware tablets uh, and Chromebooks and so on to people who don't have them as part of the access. And so a little bit of budget for that and for other access needs too. Um, but I'm pretty sure we could provide you with it with with some better figures than that. Yep. I'll make sure to, to share your details with everyone. Yeah, you know, it all out <laughs> with any <laughs> questions. Um, we have another question. Oh, sorry. I was Go ahead. Just quickly, the, chal the challenge is that no specification is going to be the same. And I think one of the issues is that we have seen some tenders go out there for ridiculously low amounts of money. And, you know, they are. And what's that that's doing is actually make creating a problem for the, if you like, the brand of citizens assemblies because they're being done cheaply and not very well. I really would before anyone's thinking about doing this, I would talk to organizations like Involve, like Demsoc about, you know, this is the sort of thing we're thinking of doing, what's a reasonable costing for this? Because I don't, you know, people are just plucking figures out of the sky, but because mm -hmm. people are doing them differently, as Sarah says, some have accommodation available, some don't, as in, sorry, a venue available and some don't, that actually the costs are going to vary, but we are talking about tens of thousands. Yeah. Got it. Um, another question coming from Rob. He is asking, how do you ensure that this is a route, so citizen assemblies are a route to radical change, not a management technique to delay change and cost drawings in the usual suspects, including voluntary and char charity sector? Maybe some thoughts on how to push for radical change through citizens assembly instead of just management um, sort of technique. Is this something that you would be able to comment on? I think, so, the sec sorry, go on. Sarah, you go first. No, I'm happy if you touch. So, so on on the kind of the bit about how do you, I think the phrase was the usual suspects, wasn't it? I'm not very comfortable with that phrase. I feel as a committed citizens would be more where I'd be going with that. But um, I think uh, one of the things about citizens assemblies is because they're usually recruited for, through sortition or a similar process where letters go out to the whole of the eligible or a large chunk of the el eligible population and people put themselves forward and then you're taking them through random random selection you do get people who you know have never voted have never participated in any other processes and so it should it shouldn't be people who always engage in the room and that's something that councils often say is really valuable that they're just seeing a whole load of people that they've never seen participate mm. before in any of their processes mm. in terms of the radical radical change point where you, you're as radical as your participants aren't you i mean i think i think this is this is part of it and within the remit of the question that's set by by whatever the organization is so you know and the organization needs to to if it's being run by a, a local council when it you know it, it's consulting on i don't know kind of the future of transport in 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 the area it, it depends what question is is set so they need to set a question that they can do something with hmm. i would say but obviously the broader you can keep the question whilst it being within it being something that you can use in the week. There's no point in doing it and people having all these ideas that you can't do anything, you can't do anything with and don't get taken forward. So as broad as you can keep it, um, and as early in the in the decision making process as you can engage, the better, I think, with the question. Graham? Yeah, I mean it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean we we tend to see we we tend to see that um, 
the citizens don't but don't very rarely do the recommendations that come out from a citizens assembly just rubber stamp what the local authority was thinking beforehand usually mm -hmm. almost always citizens think about these things in different ways to public officials but not surprised because they're not you know they've got a completely different um perspective on the world so uh, yeah i mean a lot of it is about how the task is set and what the parameters of, of what citizens are being asked to to consider is uh and how the um and what's really important at this point is having a it is about the um, advisory body that set up around it in ensuring that all the different perspectives on what could be done are, are actually being presented to those to those citizens and if if certain radical positions aren't being presented to them then they're not going to be picked up so that's the you know that's why i talked earlier about the importance about transparency and being clear of being clear to to people outside what is and what isn't being what kind of evidence is and isn't being taken mm -hmm. But you do have representatives of the public, right? So, so where you have, you know, it, it, while people can't sh do shift their positions within citizens' assemblies and what they think, and for most people, it's going to a level of considering an issue that, that they won't have looked at before. Mm. It, it, it's never, it, it's very unlikely to be as as, as radical as, as the most radical people would like it to be, because not everybody is that radical. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe just one or two very quick questions and then we really need to wrap it up. Um, one person is wondering what are the most compelling arguments to use with a ret ret reticent local authority to set up a climate assembly? And do you find there is a left-right split in terms of council engagement? So just quickly, obviously, you say the, the opportunity to work with Sarah Allen and it involved breaks down all the barriers as far as I can <laughs> There you go. That's that's then the answer. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, Sarah, just any thoughts on that, or shall we um, skip to another one? Depends about the right split because I haven't been dealing with the the, the political period coming in with council from council, so so I haven't. I, I don't know is the answer to that. Um, on on what, if a council was reticent, so, so this is this is coming back to what Graham and I were saying before, really that the, the council. I mean, maybe look for if you're someone external to the council who's looking, wanting in the council to 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 um, to run an assembly. Um, maybe looking for those issues that are locally gridlocked, where the council would see itself as having a problem that it needs to solve, that that traditional decision making methods aren't helping it to resolve. Where uh, where an assembly is solving for a problem for them as well um, mm. would be where I'd go with it. But it, it, it is, as we were saying, really important that. There is the right buy-in at the right senior levels of the council when you do run a citizens assembly for a council um so that the, the results have the opportunity to be taken oh. forward on the left on the left right just i'm just looking at the list here um you know there's certainly it's this isn't a creature of the left as some people think you know we've got kind of uh devon we've got um test valley borough council have done them we i know We've got West Midlands Combined Authority have used a sim oh. similar kind. So, so you know, it, it's being used by progressive leaders across the political spectrum, if you see what I mean. Any yeah. leaders who feel that actually hearing the voice of citizens is really critical to them to be able to make good decisions. And unfortunately, yeah. we have political authorities who feel that they don't necessarily want to hear the voice yeah. of citizens or they already have their own private channels and they don't need to do that. So I think it distinguishes the distinction is more not left right but more about your particular attitude towards participatory democracy. Absolutely yeah that makes sense. Um, so we have two more minutes and I'll just select one last question sorry for the others who didn't make it but I will share the details of um, Sarah and Graham if you want to connect with them directly of course. The last question would be do you recommend not discussing some issues at local level because you already know that the cost implications would mean non-implementation of any recommendations? Yeah don't don't discuss an issue that you can't do it what you can't do mm. anything with the results would 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 generally be well, whether that's cost or because you know the, the strategy was decided last year and there's no prospect of anybody changing it you you want to direct engagement on on something that the local area has has power over mm. um and can do something can do something with Unless your, your local, unless your local engagement is part of a nationally run process where, where you've got yeah. a chance to influence national decision makers. Yeah. And what, just one thing I'd awesome. say on that, 
one thing I'd say on that, which I don't know, uh, which I haven't thought through entirely, so I'd have to you know think think some more. But there are ways of bringing citizens into decision making where councils have got really difficult decisions to make about where they should prioritise. You know, and so um, you know, I I, I think that, uh, that that particular issue, you know, is obviously doesn't doesn't particularly make sense. But there, but but just you know, you can bring citizens into really challenging areas where where trade-offs have to be made, because that's actually where citizens' assemblies work well, where there are trade-offs. Yeah, I mean, and there's also something about, um, I guess it was quite a specific question, like running something on the specific thing where you know you don't have the money to do it. But I mean, unless Graham says you're opening up to where are the trade-offs in, in what you do do. But, but there might be other things where you're talking about kind of the aspirations, you know, for an area, for example, and some of the things that people I think it's about the honesty of having the, the conversation because you know you could see if there's a real appetite for something that the council doesn't have budget for does that open up a route for a council to, to seek funding from somewhere from somewhere exactly. else yeah. for example so I just think it's very hard to do in the abstract without knowing what what the issue what the issue is mm -hmm. um you certainly don't don't want to run a process where where the whole outcome is something that's totally unimplementable yeah. um well, it boils down to the point again of having a purpose, whatever that purpose is. Maybe it's not immediately right. recommendations for policy making, but maybe opening up a conversation, understanding where people stand, and so on. So again, closing the loop and thinking about that purpose in terms of organising engagements. Um, yeah, I'll just, I promise it's only a sentence. There is I've talked a lot. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, but I think the thing is about when you are doing citizens assembly and you have got that information giving bit to people. I mean, the point of Citizens Assembly is that people understand the reality of the situation facing, you know, in this case, a council, and that's one of the things that's so powerful about them, that that, that, that they understand the, the reality of the situation facing yeah. decision makers. Mm. Great, thank you so much. Um, yes, we could keep talking, but unfortunately we do need to wrap it up now. Otherwise I will be logged out of Zoom by one of my colleagues soon. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much both for, um, for jo joining. It's been really, really interesting. Really a pleasure for me as well, personally, to meet both of you and, and discuss this um, more thoroughly. Um, for our attendees, I will be in touch early next week with a follow up, the recording of the webinar, as well as information about our next webinar on youth engagement. And of course I will share um, Sarah and Graham's details for any of you who, who do want to get in touch with them. If you have any questions about Citizen Lab, about our online engagement platform, please do get in touch with me and obviously um, you'll have my email. Um, thank you very much. Have a lovely day, everyone. And um, I hope to see you soon for another webinar. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.